Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is September 6, 2018, and this is a bonus edition of Econ Talk, part two of our book club reading In the First Circle, the first uncensored edition by Alexandra Solzhenitsyn with University of Vermont professor of Russian language, literature, and culture, Kevin McKenna. Kevin, welcome back to Econ Talk. Yes, thank you very much. In our first episode, we talked about Solzhenitsyn's life and the political and social climate he lived uh, through. Today, we're going to turn to the book itself. Uh, I want to let listeners know you can talk about the book with your fellow readers and listeners on Facebook Facebook, and on the EconTalk subreddit we've created. We will have links to those opportunities posted on the page for this bonus edition. I also want to say there will probably be some spoilers uh, in our conversation today. You might, you might want to wait till you finish the book before listening. And having said that, uh, for me, the plot twists are not that important to enjoying the book in my view, but you may feel otherwise, so uh, be, be forewarned. Uh, let's start with – Kevin, let's start with the main characters in the book, and um, you, you've singled out three. In the first episode, we mm-hmm. talked about uh, we, what you called the polyphonic nature of the book. There are many, right. many characters woven together, but there are main characters who, who take up more time and who Solzhenitsyn wants us to understand uh, more deeply. Who are they? Sure. Well, the first so-called main character, I think the one that most identifies with Solzhenitsyn himself would be Gleb Nierzhin. Um, Gleb, as we know, has been arrested um, serving in World War II. Uh, eventually, he, he ends up in this Sharashka, or that is research camp on the edge of Moscow. And over the course of the novel, Gleb is searching, uh, as was the case for Solzhenitsyn himself at this particular age, Gleb is searching for uh, a number of answers to the meaning of life. We know he's engaged in, in a kind of spirit of Taoist philosophy and skepticism early on, and he turns to two other characters who we could call or refer to as central characters. Uh, one would be, of course, um, his philosophical communist friend, uh, uh, Rubin, Lev Rubin. Uh, ironically, Rubin is a strong, devoted communist believer. This is ironic because the fictional, uh, excuse me, Lev Rubin was one of Solzhenitsyn's, or his character, that is, Rubin's character, is based on one of Solzhenitsyn's closest friends while he was in the Gulag camp. Um, And the third character, Salogdin, has a a quite different philosophy from that of um, Rubin. While Rubin is a dedicated, devoted communist, Salogdin, I'll pronounce that slowly, uh, has a very different uh, philosophy of life. And he, Salogdin, uh, tries throughout the early part of the novel to influence uh, Gleb's understanding and approach to life. Um Salogian is essentially the master of himself. He does not give in to any philosophy. He does not give in to certainly communism. He, Salogian, believes that he himself, that the talented man or person uh, themselves in life, should dictate and control their own futures, their own fates. And as we're going to come to understand fairly early on in the novel, um, Sologian is going to make a bargain with the system whereby he, uh, as one of the engineers, the prisoner engineer Zex in the camp, he is going to go ahead and to cooperate – 
because he has, Sologin has um, discovered the secret to what has been making their whole phonologic uh, research so difficult. And in doing so, Sologin eventually is going to be able to leave the camp as a prisoner. He'll be able to return to Moscow to live in freedom. He'll be given untold wealth, etc., etc., etc. Now, I don't want to get carried away. This goes into one of the major themes of the novel. But I would say that those three central characters, Mirzhin, Rubin, and Sologin, uh, certainly occupy the first half of the novel with their various um, philosophic and ethical discussions. I would probably add uh, the character of Spiridon. He's the peasant. Um, he's nearly blind. I believe he's blind in one eye and half blind in the other eye. He is older than the other three. And he, uh, in Solzhenitsyn's creation, essentially represents the wisdom, the homespun wisdom of the Russian peasant. And in fact, while throughout the novel, Gleb Nierzhin alternates between uh, turning to Rubin and turning to Salogin for answers to the questions that he, Nierzhin, has about life, ultimately he's going to turn to Spiridon, and this comes a little bit later in the novel, and perhaps you and I can discuss that at a later point. Yeah, it's um, – it's, I think it's actually my favorite scene in the book, but uh, there are many, so it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's hard to – and let's just um, also talk about the overall plot. The mm -hmm. book opens uh, very differently from its original edition, uh, right. which was, I think, about a doctor dealing with a medical issue. Instead, this – Uncensored edition opens with uh, a Russian, a high-ranking Russian bureaucrat trying to uh, leak information to an American or Canadian um, uh, counterpart in order to alert them to a Soviet atomic uh, bomb efforts. And, that's right. And that's the first five pages of the novel. Uh, right. And for a while, we kind of. It kind of disappears for a while. Uh, we're we're mm -hmm. not quite sure how how or if that's going to come back into the plot, but of course there's a, a phone call, and we don't know for a while whether it's recorded or not. But that phone call becomes um, a centerpiece of the last oh maybe third of the novel. Right. And um, why do you think he chose this? Why did he? Let's not talk about why he censored. The plot, I, that's pretty clear. Mm -hmm. I can understand that. Right. But when, why is this the, the plot that he wanted to write about? Mm -hmm. um, essentially, he wasn't – Solzhenitsyn was not satisfied um, with the success of the Valodian. This is the name of the um, state security officer, kind of a young diplomat yep. in his early 30s. Solzhenitsyn was not uh, in his censored version, which is the version that appears in 1968. Uh, Solzhenitsyn was not satisfied with his success in both the character of Volodyan himself as well as the success of the plot line. Uh, in his uh, censored version, Solzhenitsyn's censored version, uh, as you noted, we have a fictional event where Volodyan places a telephone call to uh, a friend of the family, a doctor, and this all deals with essentially, again, a fictional event. Um, one of the problems with the first printed version which would actually be the, uh, the initial version of the censored novel. One of the problems with that is that there are eight chapters that Solzhenitsyn had had to um, delete. And they, a lot of those chapters, particularly in the central part of the novel, in the first circle as opposed to the first circle, uh, those chapters were deleted and they they create and embellish and focus on Volodyn's character as well as the central 
plot line. Uh, Solzhenitsyn goes to this factual event. Um, he, as a Russian, he, as a writer, is very keen on fact. And the, what, what may seem to us in the 2009 translation in the first circle, what may seem to us as um, an extraordinary, uh, difficult-to-believe event that is a Russian diplomat calling the American embassy in Moscow to warn the American embassy of a plot of a Soviet in New York City to receive the secret plans for the atomic bomb from the Americans. While that sounds ludicrous, it is entirely factually based on the Kavalov incident that takes place, indeed, in 1949 in New York City. Um, as a reader of the novel, I would say Solzhenitsyn's treatment of the factual event is infinitely better than what I see to be his unsuccessful treatment of the fictional calling of a Russian doctor. What I found surprising about that decision, mm -hmm. and I you know, as an American, uh, I might – I don't know how a Russian would – of the day of the time would view it, a Soviet citizen reading it in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, or mm -hmm. today. But what I found fascinating about that is the, is the linchpin of the, of the story is that we're deeply enmeshed in the, in the uh, Sharashka with the ethical and moral dilemmas of, of Nirjan – um, Rubin and Sologdan, right. and they talk about them all the time. Uh, right. Some of them they don't talk about, obviously, because they can't. But but we hear their inner dialogue often, and and we understand how the difference between say Rubin and between and and, and Nerjan, and how the commitment to communism for Rubin is a uh, affects his decision making and so right. on. Right. Uh, we understand that Sologdan is tempted by rewards to, to make progress on this technology that ultimately is going to help the regime enslave people uh, and harm them and oppress them. And, and so we all understand this horrible central dilemma at the heart of the, of the, of the novel. Right. And yet the uh, Volodin uh, phone call, which starts the novel, uh, it's, that's, we, that's treason. <laughs> he, he is he is betraying uh, the Soviet Union, and, and would and pres and there was a debate within the book. Of course, the uh, the characters in the, in the Sharashka debate whether they should rely on the Americans, whether the Americans are a force for good, whether the Soviets are evil. You know the mm -hmm. the, the power uh, in, the, in the party. So they're all dealing with that, but. But Solzhenitsyn creates this character at the center of the, of the novel in the background, Vol Volodin, who, who is betraying his, his country, weakening his country, keeping his country – trying to keep his country from getting access to technology that will allow them to compete against the Americans. Mm -hmm. And I found that to be a fascinating decision and um, major spoiler alert uh, – so if you're if you want to uh, stop listening here, you may. Uh, major spoiler: alert, He gets caught, and mm -hmm. his um, and it's a brutal experience. And in fact, we know it's going to be much more brutal than what we observe in in the novel itself. And um, are we supposed to root for him? Feel sorry for him? And if I were Soviet, would I feel differently if as an than I do as an American? I found that part very interesting. It created a lot of tension that it didn't didn't have to. Could have yeah. just been a, a a much less complicated uh, crime. Yeah. Uh, well, Russ, Russ, let me in, uh, address some of the points that you're making there because there's something that you're missing very very uh, key to this novel. Um, without a doubt, you're entirely correct. This act was treasonous uh, if and when um, Velojin were to be captured and just say tried for having made this treasonous act, he would either be sent directly to a gulag camp 
or even more likely, was killed. I, think, yeah. I think he'd be executed yep. in the Lubyanka uh, prison. Yeah, after being uh, tortured, but yeah. That's right. And what you what you miss there, if you, you and your readers look, I believe it's perhaps the closing paragraphs of chapter one, if I'm correct. I unfortunately left my copy of the novel up at, at my office on campus. I have, but it at with, any rate, I have mine with me. Good. There's a line that says, uh, and this is, these are um, um, Valojin's kind of inner thoughts. And he says to himself, if a man cannot live according or in concert with the dictates of his conscience, how can we possibly live? How can we possibly call ourselves human beings? Now, I've, I've um, entirely misquoted that since I don't have the book here in front of me. But that is uh, essentially one of the central three themes throughout this entire novel. Um, in the censored version, that is uh, 86, 95, I, I think nine chapters shorter than the novel that your uh, listeners are reading, um, this question appears just about in every single central character of the novel. Ultimately, of course, um, the peasant Spiridon is going to pro uh, provide the answer to that question. Uh, throughout the entirety of the novel, Valodian is on a search. Uh, he is on an adventure of sorts. As you've already indicated, while the novel opens with Valodian, the final chapters of the novel will, will, will end with Volodyan, he indeed is going to be caught, and we see that he, Volodyan, in those closing chapters, commences a life at the point where we have been meeting Gleb Nirzhen, uh, tying, of course, the two characters together. Further tying the two characters together, of course, is this theme of conscience. Yep. A human being in Solzhenitsyn's um, mind, in his belief, in his character, in his soul, we human beings have to be able to live consistently with the terms of conscience in our own lives. Um, were Volodyan not to take this act, were he to continue to live the kind of sybaritic life that he has been leading all of his life, he understands that he essentially would not remain human. He would be giving into the system. So while, Russ, you're entirely correct that um, this is a, a, a treasonous act, it's an act that he has to undertake in order to remain a human being, in order to be able to live with his conscience. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I don't. Um, I, I understand that. And, and when I called it a treasonous act, you know, I, obviously, uh, treason against an, an immoral regime can be a virtuous thing. I didn't. Mm -hmm. You know, treason is a negative term. Right. Uh, but I, I just wondered whether the reader in in the Soviet Union in 1968 or mm -hmm. or today had would have some. Unease about. Uh, let me say it differently. Mm -hmm. The Zex in the Sharashka who work on the technology that on voice recognition and and voice uh, crypt, you know, cryptography. Right. They, they're we sympathize tremendously with them because th they're caught between a rock and a hard place that mm -hmm. no human being should be should be should have to deal with. Very you know very similar to moral dilemmas in 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 Auschwitz and elsewhere where people were put in an – there's no attractive solution. There's nothing um, – you're forced to do something immoral or die. And mm -hmm. often the, the immoral act that you're doing is – it has grayness to it in the sense that – I mean here in the Shiroshka, there's nothing gray about it. Obviously, there's nothing good about giving the Soviet regime uh, more ability to – to, to eavesdrop and uh, and punish people, so it's not fun to work on that. But but I would think that 
there is a certain level at which betraying your your country in in this in this particular in the middle of the Cold War. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll say let me ask it let me say it a different way. I understand that many Soviet citizens during the Cold War rooted quietly for the Americans uh, in the West. But some of them must have had some misgivings uh, about that, and and I just I find it interesting that the book doesn't come to grips with that and gives us sure. a moral dilemma at its center that is that's a little more complicated to me than the Sharashka's mm-hmm. occupants' moral dilemmas. Mm-hmm. Well, I think you might be overemphasizing, let's say, the number of Soviet citizens during the Cold War who were rooting for the Americans. With respect to the space race between the two countries, uh, indeed, I did find that to be the case. Uh, I could go on and on for that at great length, but I don't think it's all that germane to the novel. Um, but the during the Soviet period, and today, by the way, the Russians in 2018, are fiercely patriotic. Your very good question about how would the readers today look at Sologin's, I apologize, at Volodyn's um, treasonous act of calling the embassy um, is good for this reason. I would say that those Russians today reading this novel, who indeed have found that comfort place in their own conscience, they would agree with Volodyn. But I can assure you, the overwhelming vast majority of Russians today, pretty much, by the way, uh, the same for, I would say, the overwhelming number of American citizens today, have not reached that comfort zone between the way that we lead our lives and the success or failure in uh, its relationship to our conscience. Are we motivated primarily, as is Solzhenitsyn and, of course, Glyabnerzhin, are we motivated primarily by our conscience, our duty to our conscience, or, like the overwhelming vast majority of Russians and Americans, are we motivated more so by personal interests oh, yeah. no, that I, might have to do with a, a career or getting ahead, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. And I, just to be clear, I, I think mm-hmm. Volodin's act is a heroic act, but right. I'm, right. I'm raising the question whether others might might not have felt that way. Um, some let, some would, and some would not. Let's. I want to ask you another question about conscience, which I found fascinating. Um, yes. Which is, and we touched on this very briefly, and I may have confused some readers, uh, some mm-hmm. listeners, last episode. In, in real life, Solzhenitsyn divorces his wife uh, f- on the grounds that it's very hard for her to be married to a prisoner. It's a common right. experience. Very And I, I think I asked you and we left it hanging. I think they remarry. Is that correct? They do. I believe uh, uh, this is his first wife whom he divorces, and they remarry once he gets out of the camp. Not right away, not right. immediately. I think that they remarry somewhere around 1957. So, I could be off on that year, but it was toward the end of the 50s. But for me, one of the most poignant, uh, un- unbearable parts of this book are the um, romantic and, and sexual oh, relationships between yes. – the prisoners and the women in their lives, some of whom are staff members, some of whom, sure. of course, their their wives back home, mm-hmm. and you know the the very um, the scene. I, I just want to mention this in passing. You know, you're given the advice as a writer to write what you know about. So mm-hmm. Jensen is drawing, you know, so deeply when he's describing the corridors and the, the stairwells. You, you don't. You don't feel like he's trying to imagine them. You feel like you're with him <laughs> in those situations. And the yep. scene where where the prisoners have I, I think it's how long do they have with their wives? Is it Oh gosh, I want to 30 say, minutes, 10 minutes. I think it's, I think it's 30 minutes it, and and with it's a guard once a, year. once a year with a guard who's who's <laughs> who's, right. who's looming over you, not giving and you, you a moment touch. of and you can't touch. There there's something just unbearably sad about this and Yes, and the Solzhenitsyn character in the novel Gleb, 
has a sexual opportunity mm-hmm. uh, that he turns down. And we also get to watch his his wife, the Gleb's mm-hmm. wife, have a potential romantic or sexual relationship. Right. And Gleb does the honorable thing. He honors his marriage. He foregoes the um, – the sexual opportunity, and it's it's really an extraordinary. Uh, I, I found it very powerful, given that, um, you know, we don't know what what Solzhenitsyn did in the camps romantically, mm-hmm. personally. We don't know what he sure. did ethically. Right. Uh, but what I found extraordinary about this, one of the many things I found extraordinary about the book, is that it was clear that this is what he wanted to be, Solzhenitsyn, mm-hmm. whether. It, in the form of Gleb, whether he actually lived such a high code in 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 his real life experiences, we don't know, or I don't think we know. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's clear that in his fictional ideal, he was he was an honorable man in in virtually every dimension. It's really sure. it's such a heroic uh, uh, story uh, for so many of the of the characters, but for him especially. Yeah. Well, Solzhenitsyn. Um, the man, no, not the writer, um, has acknowledged that he he was not as comfortable with the way that he and the hundreds of thousands of Soviet soldiers during World War II um, conducted themselves as they uh, approached essentially uh, Germany. Um, he does not or he did not take pride uh, in in what his fellow uh, soldiers and he, and he himself um, were doing. Um, I would not go so far as to say that he failed to to live up to his ideals. Um, Solzhenitsyn is perhaps, in my, in my opinion, I can't think of anyone, any writer or any person, who succeeds in living up to his ideals um, more so than he himself. Uh, does he have occasional failures? Yes, he did. But um, I don't think that those, that is, the failures of Solzhenitsyn, uh, the person, as opposed to the fictional um, world that he creates in his novels, um, I find his fictional world far more interesting than his real world. Oh, yeah. And that's saying quite a bit because <laughs> yeah. his real world was, uh, was actually yeah. quite alive. Let, let's turn to the Stalin chapters. There are four, uh, four or five stap- chapters on Stalin, uh, which I enjoyed just tremendously. Um, I found them incredibly entertaining uh, funny in a in a dark way, of course. Sure. Um, and fascinating as uh, psychological portraits of uh, of a monster. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you could have cut them out of the book. They they play no uh, direct role. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to add one more aspect of the book, which I which I want you to tie these two together, which is the another one of my. Favorite chapters was the uh, the Troika of Liars. Oh, of course. Where we see these bumbling, overpromising, stressed out Soviet bureaucrats and military officials lie and overpromise, and, and the psychological insights are just you know just unbelievable. The 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 temptations of in those settings are just they're beautifully mm-hmm. uh, portrayed, but y- you don't need them. So talk about what they add. I say need them. You, they don't – if they were literally cut – if those were the chapters you cut, uh, you wouldn't lose any of the plot, but you'd lose something else. So why do you think they're there other than to indulge sure. uh, our enjoyment of them, which they're, they're spectacular, but mm. why are they there? I'm going to speak out of both sides of my mouth right now. <laughs> Um, you've made a very good observation in that many, many, many literary critics, both Russian literary critics and those from the United States and Europe, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, a lot of literary critics feel that the Stalin chapters are unsuccessful and that indeed they could be deleted. 
speaking now out of the other side of my mouth, um, I would not agree. Uh, and the reason I don't agree is that those chapters 19 through 23, not only do we, let's say, American voyeur readers who uh, encounter this scathing indictment of the psychopathology of Stalin himself, what we fail to, to recognize is that um, like the Zex, the prisoners in the first circle of hell, Stalin himself finds, by the last two chapters, 19 to 23, realizes that he himself <laughs> resides in his own circle of hell, a hell of, uh, let's say what, of self-deception or a hell of ego or of fear or of doubt, of suspicion. He's fearing and suspecting and resenting Lenin, who is now decades dead, and we see um, this, this psychological pathology of Stalin himself, where he has imprisoned himself in his own personal circle of hell. And by extension, I would say, as, as you um, initially indicated, the, what, the management, the head of the military departments uh, and the research departments, they too uh, find themselves in a first circle of hell, like the Zek prisoners. For example, um, when chapter 10, when entitled the Razakrushans, when the two prisoners, Pranchikov and Babuinian, um, go to visit Colonel Yakonov, and they are able to uh, exercise far greater freedom than the head of this institute, Yakonov, can. Uh, I think it's Pranchikov who says, and I quote, you need me and I don't need you. He goes on to say, shout at your colonels and generals. They've got a lot to lose. But the man from whom you've taken everything is no longer in your power. He is free again. This is a direct quote from that chapter. And by extension, uh, we note that the Deputy Minister of State Security, Sevastyanov, as well as the head of the Special Equipment Section of the Ministry of State Security, Major General Askalupov, and finally the Chief of Operations at the Institute, the Colonel of Engineers um, Yakonov, they're going to have to meet with and lie to Stalin's Minister of State Security, General Abakumov, in the same way that the Zeks have, a li have lied to Yakonov. Of their progress, in, in other, and yeah. Yeah, in other words, the, the, the extension of Dante's metaphor of hell is very rich in this novel. And in response to your, your original um, observation, I would keep the Stalin chapters because we see that at the very top, at the pinnacle of this, this triangular power relationship, Stalin, obviously, he too is a prisoner. And I, and he's also in some way, you know, the other metaphor that came to my mind besides the first circle is, is a web, a spider sure. web of, of Very good. everyone's trapped and struggling to, to get free. Mm -hmm. And Stalin, in some sense, is the weaver of the web. He's the Absolutely. spider at the center, but Absolutely. he's entangled in it also in so many, so many ways. Yes. And, the, you know, there's another chapter you could do without uh, in, in theory, which is the, uh, the extraordinarily brilliant. Uh, chapter where the there's a, a propaganda lecture on Stalinist theory, mm -hmm. and oh yes, and it has no content the the mm -hmm. lecture, but of course it it seems grand and important, and we watch as the as the attendees drift off, write notes to each other, just like in a mm -hmm. you know a bad school uh, sure. setting, and um, it, it reminded me, and it is a very uh, it feels weird making this contemporary reference, but it reminded me a lot of the. Uh, the series called The Wire, where oh, yes. which is about uh, Baltimore and 
It's mm-hmm. David Simon's brilliant creation of the in the first season of the uh, drug war, uh, and you see the the different characters, the drug addicts, the dealers, the police, and the bureaucrats above the police, mm-hmm. all enmeshed in this system, trying to do their jobs, get ahead, make money, get promoted, and uh, it's a very symbiotic relationship akin to, you know, you need me, I don't need you. Uh, They all need each other, uh, unfortunately. Many of the characters need each other, and they find themselves in what is essentially an immoral landscape. There's really no – going to be no easy way to to go forward in line with one's conscience. Mm -hmm. And um, in that series, one of the things that's so effective about it is you don't know who to root for after a while. You you start sympathizing with the drug dealers who just are like any other business trying to – uh, but then again, you got people dying from drug overdoses, and then you've got the police doing brutal things, but also trying to do what they think is the right thing. You know, it's very, it, it's a, it's similar in the sense that the system itself has a set of incentives that are um, relentless, and mm-hmm. I think that's a better way to describe what's going on here. The uh, rather than just say it's it's symbiotic, the the incentives built into the system are. Uh, entrap everyone. In this case, mm-hmm. the, the Zechs want to provide the technology because that way they might get free. Right. The, the bureaucrats want to make Stalin happy so they can get a promotion. Stalin wants to be free of his worries and fears of, mm-hmm. of being over, overthrown. He wants to have more power. It's hard to believe, but he does. Mm-hmm. And given those incentives, which, of course, Stalin has created and the system itself has has emerged from his – paranoia and brutality, Mm -hmm. uh, everyone is then entangled in it in different ways, enmeshed with each other, enmeshed in, in the, the, those, those brutal incentives. And, and of course, much of the book is the heroism of the Zex who Mm -hmm. refuse to respond to those incentives. It's just an important point in economics. We always Mm -hmm. assume people respond to incentives. And of course, most of the time they do, often they do in some dimension, they almost always do. But sometimes something calls with a higher incentive, that of conscience. And I think that triumph of people um, just refusing to betray their conscience mm-hmm. in, in return for uh, what seems to be gain is mm-hmm. really the – is uh, as you mentioned in private email with me, it's really the, the essential lesson of the book that, sure. that there, there are times when – when we um, forego benefit uh, for greater for greater good, and it's um, mm-hmm. just such a poignant, powerful yeah. example of that. Spinning off of what you've just said, uh, let me what note a kind of ironically, we see how uh, those people in the novel, and they're primarily the prisoners, the sex, those who are in their own first circle of hell, the prisoners, uh, quite creatively and engagingly. Solzhenitsyn indicates that those occupants of the first circle of hell tend to be far freer yep. than those who occupy the first circle of power, whether it's Abakumov, a historically accurate uh, uh, person, uh, he's not a fictional creation, or whether it's Stalin himself. And I would say next to, or maybe alongside um, conscience, the, the theme of being free. And for a writer like Solzhenitsyn, uh, as well as the prisoner Solzhenitsyn, the theme of freedom, how is it, uh, can a prisoner be free? And what Solzhenitsyn, I think, succeeds doing in this novel, and really in all of his fiction, is to indicate that um, prisoners in life or in the Soviet Union can actually be freer than those people living outside the camps. You may want to, to um, delete what I'm about to, to share, kind of a personal experience, but let me go ahead, if that's okay with you, Please. To, share, to share an experience that I had, oh gosh, this would have been about 19... Mm-hmm. About 1981. Um, I won't go into all the details, but I was living for about a year and a half in, in then Leningrad, uh, 
Um, and I was a great uh, lover of jazz. And I happened into a jazz bar in Leningrad. And I met um, a man, a Zek, a prisoner, who had been arrested in 1976 and sentenced to a gulag camp. His was up on the Arctic Circle, essentially for mooning the president of the United States. I believe this would have been perhaps Jimmy Carter way back in 1976. But at any rate, I met this fellow. His name is Sasha. Um, no last names intended. And Sasha could not have been more excited to meet an American whom he naively felt would take Sasha's story back to the yeah. Washington, D.C. And his story was essentially this. Uh, he and I spent a night together, uh, essentially listening to my listening to his account of what it was like to live in this camp for five or six years. And it was an awful story. I, I don't need to rehearse it. We can just read Solzhenitsyn's novel. But I remember how he ended the story. He said, we were on well, probably about the seventh floor of a hotel, and we're sitting in a window, open window. And he said, look at those people down there on the street. This was now 5 a.m. And granted, women were pouring in from all corners of that part of the city uh, with their milk jugs, essentially to have their jug uh, milk jugs filled up with milk, blah, blah, blah. And looking out of this window on the seventh floor of a hotel, uh, it looked like ants crawling around. Sure. And he said, he said, this is life in the Soviet Union outside of the camps. There's no way in the world that these people are free. He said, I, for six years living in the camp, was far freer than these people that we're looking at down, down on the ground. And this is what, in my opinion, Solzhenitsyn is trying to capture and to share and to pass on with, uh, to his readers the value, the meaning of freedom, uh, matched, of course, with his, his great thoughts on living in concert with one's conscience. Yeah, I just want to add, uh, it's very well said, I want to add, add two things to that. One is it reminds me of uh, Viktor Frankl's man's Search for Meaning, which a book <laughs> yes. I recommend, which is a yes. similar theme idea that that physical suffering is not really the measure of, of our, our physical pleasure. It's not the measure of our well-being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's a theme we might come back to or any kind of talk sometime. It's a deep, obvious, deep philosophical issue. But the other point I want to make uh, is that you know, I think Solzhenitsyn hammers on that relentlessly in the oh, book. Yes. The the idea that almost that um, it reminds me of friends of ours who had two kids and uh, lived in a two bedroom apartment. The two boys, young boys, shared the apart shared a bedroom. When they went to visit a friend in the suburbs that lived in a, an enormous house, one of the kids said to the other, "I feel sorry for them. Each kid has to sleep by himself." Uh -huh. And and I think. I wonder how much Solzhenitsyn's rationalizing this this unbearable, horrific deprivation that that he has to go through, that his life is ripped from him, that his the pleasures of married life and and normal society are unavailable to him, mm -hmm. and he's stuck in this horrible first circle of hell. It's better than the mm -hmm. other ones, but he's stuck in this circle. And he, so one thought I had, of course, is that well, this is the way he deals with it. Is that he says, ah, ah, it's actually better. It's not just not so bad. It's actually better. I feel sorry for those poor people struggling right. as they did in the Soviet Union to f get their milk for the day and to mm -hmm. just go through the, the – I'll say it a different way. Daily life under communism was, was somewhat degrading. It, oh, it did yes. not have the um, opportunities that, that we're blessed with and that so many people have today. Mm -hmm. um, and so he was right to some extent, but you also wonder whether he was psychologically just trying to make himself feel better. At the same time, uh, it's obviously tr true that – and he captures this so well – that his life in the prison was like being in a philosophy seminar. And I think he was being <laughs> – I don't think it's just artistic. I think, mm -hmm. I think the conversations he had there, uh, just like wartime is often a, a 
for all its horror, is is a transformative event for the people who are fortunate to survive. Mm -hmm. So it's not like he would say, oh, everyone should have the thrill of being in a camp. He's saying, well, in the camp, you are forced to come to grips with with meaning and philosophical and ethical issues. The other point I want to just make quickly, which I thought is, you know, is a fiction uh, motif, is just extraordinary in the book, is that the real gulag looms over the book. Uh, the characters who, at the end, go off to the real gulag who have to leave the Sharashka, who trundle off in the meat wagon, which mm -hmm. is unbelievably – I get goosebumps just mentioning <laughs> it – as it's driving around town and and deceiving the passers by who see it and think it must be a, a food delivery. That's right. But it's actually human beings going off to a far worse fate than the mm -hmm. than the first circle of hell, the Sharashka. Mm -hmm. They – and and Volodin, who we see is basically his first night in prison, uh, the worst and even more horrific things that await those people are never described. Uh, they're oh. never they're never made vivid. Now we can read about them in his other books. Obviously, we can read about them in the book *The Gulag*, which is nonfiction. We can read about them in *One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich*, which mm -hmm. isn't a real camp. But in this book. He makes the conscious, clearly conscious decision not to embellish. Uh, he lets – he doesn't um, doesn't exploit that to make us feel even sadder. He lets it be unspoken. I think that's just an, an unbelievably interesting uh, fictional decision. Well, I could not agree with you more, and, and you're touching upon something that I believe is very important – for us Americans reading Solzhenitsyn's novels to understand, when his, first, when his works were first being translated into English and becoming accessible to us here at the end of the 60s, throughout the 70s, the early 80s, and so on and so on, typically we Americans thought, oh, Solzhenitsyn is a genius, and we thought that he was so good because essentially he was revealing to the world the sins of Stalin and the tragedies of the um, of the camps, the gulag camps. What I find to be, and, and this is going to triangulate back to the early part of your last um, observation, what I find to be the genius of Solzhenitsyn's fiction, his novels, um, is not that he reveals what Stalin did or what life in the camps was like. It's his artistry, yeah. the manner in which he does this. And what I mean by the manner or his artistry uh, is precisely what you're referring to, the success. I think if we go back to one day in the life of Ivan Denisovich, um, those of your listeners who have read that novel already or who may want to uh, in the future, um, your listeners are, and you and I, are absolutely astounded by the horror yeah. of this one day, this 24-hour period out of whatever it is, 3,364 days. Uh, and what Solzhenitsyn does, he never in the novella Ivan Denisovich or in this novel, um, uh, In the First Circle, he never screams out his pain yes, or the pain of his prisoners or his observation. It's the understatement yep. that uh, is, is the main artistic device, I would say, that Solzhenitsyn employs in his writing. Uh, he leaves it up to us, his readers, to essentially scream our heads off, yeah. uh, but never once does he or his prisoners do so. Let's turn to the set pieces in the book uh, that reminded me of Dostoevsky. Uh, there's mm -hmm. a lot that reminded me of Dostoevsky, and we talked about this last time. And you know, the other thing I mentioned last time was the um, the Faulkner Nobel Prize oh, that's line uh, about the great fictions about the human heart and conflict with itself. Mm -hmm. And I think your observation that – I think he, he made it very – it was very, it's very clear in his novels that Solzhenitsyn didn't want to write a bunch of books about Stalin's crimes. 
He wanted to also he did, but he also wanted to write about the human heart and conflict with itself, and that's really what makes this work. That that understatement so powerful. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let's turn to the set pieces. Uh, there are two there are two chapters that struck me as, as sort of standalone. You could you could publish them as short stories. The more than two, but two leap out because they're so self contained. Right. One is the trial of Prince Igor, and the other is the Buddha's smile. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Buddha's smile. Um, it's the Buddha's smile. The Buddha possessive Buddha's right. smile is again a heartbreaking glimpse at uh, deception. That's right. And where I mean, it's just it's a it's hilarious and it's heartbreaking at the same time. Mm-hmm. Uh, talk about both those if you can, and, and what. It's almost, in a way, it reminded me, you know, that he was channeling Dostoevsky, or, or because Dostoevsky does the same thing. I'll have a chapter that sort of stands by itself, and mm-hmm. and, and many of Dostoevsky's chapters like that have been republished sort of on their own. Um, so, talk about the influence of Dostoevsky on Stalin, and I mean, on uh, Solzhenitsyn, and the and those two chapters, if you could. Sure. Well, the, the way I would begin my comments um, is to refer back to the very last document that Solzhenitsyn wrote the day before he was kicked out, exiled from the Soviet Union. And it's, it's a letter which is called Live Not By Lies. Live Not By Lies. And this is something very important thematically as well as personally to Solzhenitsyn the writer and Solzhenitsyn the person. And in the chapter Buddha's Smile, the deception, the... Um, it's all a lie. It's all a lie. And, and it's what he's, in a certain sense, much as he does with the meat wagon at the very last two pages of the novel, there's the reality of a bystander on a street in the center of Moscow looking at, I guess it's a Frenchman, looking at a wagon, food wagon going by, and he says, oh, how nice. The the Soviets are trying to get, you know, deliveries of their um, uh, food to their citizens. While it's just the opposite. It's a meat wagon in the sense that some poor prisoners who have been just kicked out of the Sharashka, the research institute, and they're now bound for hell. Their first circle that they experienced in the Sharashka, the research institute, long gone. Yeah. They're going to uh, the worst circles of hell. Now, um, Buddha's smile, um, Solzhenitsyn was very aware and not pleased with, and we can even look later to his Um, Nobel Prize address or to his speech at the Harvard commencement, Solzhenitsyn was never comfortable with what he saw to be uh, the United States' inability to see evil of the Soviet Union as it really was. And certainly uh, Mrs. Roosevelt and her little delegation visiting one of the camps And falling into the trap, excuse me, into the trap of believing everything that their Soviet hosts are showing them. That is, the fresh clothing, change of clothing, the good meals, the elaborate meals. The religious Um, books for exploring. That's right. The Quran and a Bible. That's right. And and they've prepared, uh, that is, the system has prepared the prisoners so well, Mrs. Roosevelt uh, inquires of one of them, I'm here representing the United States. Is there anything you prisoners here in the Soviet Union would like to share with me that you would like Americans to understand? And the question, of course, that one of them asks, or mostly states, he says, we're very much upset by uh, the issue of slavery and racism in the United States. Well, clearly, this is not at all an issue that Soviet prisoners in a gulag camp are concerned about. Uh, This is what they have been told to say. And, of course, we see the naivete of Mrs. Roosevelt uh, 
um, essentially through Solzhenitsyn's eyes of this is yet another instance of Americans not understanding anything about actual life in the Soviet Union. Now, this is a fictional event as far as I can tell. Eleanor Roosevelt. Oh, uh, no, actually, um, she did. No, she factually, I guess I want to say, she did visit um, uh, a camp. Now, frankly, as I recall, this was not uh, a camp in which Solzhenitsyn was present, but he heard this story from one of mm -hmm. his fellow campmates an experience that he had had at, at, at a different gulag camp. I could be wrong about that, but it I couldn't find like it. I couldn't find any historical uh, mm -hmm. record of that. So if there is, we'll put a link up to it. It doesn't matter. Oh. Yeah. What is, what's, what's true is that Americans starting with, with Lenin visited the mm -hmm. Soviet Union and brought back loan reports that were oh, gosh. terribly inaccurate. Um, <laughs> New York times sure. reporters won Pulitzer prizes for reports that were, literally lies. They, exactly. they hid the famine in, in the Ukraine, the deaths in the, in, in the Ukraine, and uh, that's Walter Durante. His, his, it's, a, right. it's despicable that that prize has never been, in my view, that's never been revoked. Mm -hmm. But um, people lied knowingly on behalf of the Soviet Union as well as unknowingly, and this is an unknowing, yeah. Yeah, uh, naive impression. And um, same thing has happened, of course, with, with Castro in Cuba and others. Um, but uh, that that chapter is just just spectacular. The the trial of Prince Igor is talk about what that represents. It's genius, absolute genius. While it might seem initially as what does this have to do with the gulag camps of the twentieth century, um, it's a wonderful satire, essentially talking about how it is that, or what would he be, probably a 13th century um, Russian prince by the name of Igor, how it is that Prince Igor uh, becomes a captive of, I believe that the, it's a tribe of Mongol invaders. At any rate, um, the 20th century court trial is is to try the 13th century um, Prince Eager for his uh, failure to live up to the dictates of the Soviet system. So it is a huge comical chapter um, in which Solzhenitsyn brilliantly satirizes the Soviet system of law. And, uh, and the this article, this ex are talking about Prince Igor because well, what's wrong with that? It's it's eight hundred seven hundred years ago, but mm -hmm. of course they're really talking about the present. Yeah, and they're talking about the present in the sense that that famous what is it Article fifty eight? Yeah, the the criminal code article under which essentially all of the Gulag prisoners were tried and found guilty. Um, this uh, chapter essentially is um, bringing Prince Igor to trial under Article 58. Yeah. And I, I just want to mention that the other, one of the most chilling asides in the book, which is just a passing remark, is when they, uh, they can't decide which of the two potential suspects are guilty on the voice mm -hmm. recording they have. One of them, oh, of course, yes. is we know is the real person. It's Volodin. The other, I forget his name, some other bureaucrat in the state security office. Uh, the general says, "Oh well, well, we'll find something on him too. Don't worry. You know, don't That's don't right. don't feel bad mm -hmm. because all of us are guilty of something. We we didn't maybe smile sufficiently. That's right. Uh, when Stalin passed by or whatever it was. So in fact, Rubin, a, a very very um, enjoyable, prominent, likable character, notwithstanding his marriage to communism, Rubin, um, at, towards the end of the novel, when, when um, Valojin has been separated as indeed the person who made the telephone call, Rubin begins to experience a little bit of a sense of guilt, saying, oh gosh, now this 
fellow, he doesn't know, well, um, Balogian, is going to be sentenced and subject to the kind of life that we live here in the gulags. And then he thinks, well, no, the positive side of this is that the other four people who were accused um, are going to be free. And it's, it's an ironic kind of <clears throat> notion on Solzhenitsyn's part of how it is that we or one can kind of shift gain uh, uh, guilt or blame to suit um, our consciences. Yeah, that's um, extraordinary. Um, talk about uh, – I'd like to – I'd like to close with um, with some insights about Spiridon. The uh -huh. I, so he's half blind, mm -hmm. and um, if I remember, he's. By the way, I read the book this summer, I, which was was wonderful that I that I found time for it. But I don't have time. I didn't have time to read it again before right. our conversation. I, I suspect you've read it more than once. Is that correct? <laughs> Yes, I follow um, Vladimir Nabokov's um, beliefs on reading. If he made a very famous statement when he was teaching a literature class at Cornell University, end of the 1950s. And one of his graduate students made the observation that I, like Russ, in fact, um, read this novel during the summer, but I haven't uh, read it again since, and I'm not really following what you're saying. And Nabokov responded by saying, reading a novel? There is no such thing as reading a novel. Novels can only be reread, hmm. reread, <laughs> and reread. Um, so that is kind of a, a humorous injection on my part. Yeah. That's uh, nice. About you're not having reread it yet. I can pretty much guarantee you. You will reread this oh, I novel. hope to. Uh, but my memory is is that Sp Spiridon, who I would have mispronounced worse uh, but <laughs> than that, but Sp Spiridon is uh, – he sweeps up. He's the guy who's um, – is that right? Does he sweep – is he the snow sweeper? Yes, he's, he's the snow sweeper. He's um, – unlike the genius uh, physicists and chemists and mathematicians, et cetera, et cetera – who populate this research institute, um, Spiridon is more or less sent there by mistake uh, to the institute, and he ends up uh, being, he's a, he never even finished high school, much less college. Um, he's not an intellect, he's not an intellectual, but he, he's wise, he's wise. He's very wise. <laughs> he is, he is uh, enlisted, in a sense, to sweep floors and to sweep the snow or shovel the snow outside between two points in this camp. And in relation to that, um, Salogdian and um, Nierzhen come out to work, that is to, to shovel the snow with Spiridon as often as they can so that they can carry out and conduct the kinds of philosophical conversations that they so love to do. And you mentioned earlier that Spiridon stands in for the sort of the wisdom of the peasant. And mm -hmm. uh, before we started taping, you mentioned a, a proverb of his. So explain what that, sure. that is. The, we have seen how it is that um, Nierzhen, early on in the novel, sees himself as a follower of Taoism. He sees himself a little bit later as a skeptic. And then for hundreds of pages, he's turning to um, Rubian, his friend, for kind of answers on the meaning of life. And he alternates in turning to, um, um, excuse me, um, I'm trying to say Spiridon, but I don't want to say Spiridon. Sologdin, right? Sologdin, thank you, yeah. to his friend Sologdin. And finally, let's say roughly at the last third of the novel, Nierzhen realizes that neither communism of um, Rubin or the kind of uh, will, the power of the will of the intellect, which characterizes um, Sologdin, neither of these two 
paths in life satisfies Nirjan um, in terms of providing the answers to the meanings of life. And so he turns indeed to Spiridon, late, late in the novel, and uh, he, in a long lead-in paragraph, he says, essentially, we see all this suffering and crime and, and the, uh, the people who have been slaughtered in our country by Stalin, etc., etc., and he said, tell me, what is right? What is truth in all of this? And Spiridon responds with a very, very famous and yet age-old wisdom, Russian wisdom, Russian proverb, by saying, let's see, how would I translate this into English? By saying something to the effect... Um, you want to say it in Russian he, first for us? Well, I'm, I'm now in the English part of it. the wolfhound. The wolfhound is right. The man who hunts men is wrong. And what what this proverb means is that the nature of a wolf out in the wilderness can't blame him. When that's right, it's it's by his own internal nature that he, the wolf, hunts. But he says, when a man hunts the lives and souls of his fellow man, that is wrong. And this is a moment that goes back, this particular moment that we're referring to, goes back to um, Tolstoy's novel, War and Peace, when one of the main characters uh, turns yet again to a peasant. And the response of... Um, Prince Pierre in War and Peace is the same response of uh, Nierjen in Solzhenitsyn's novel. What? Say that again. Hmm. Finally, I understand. It's a brilliant chapter. Well, the, my favorite moment in the book, I probably said that already to today, so I apologize, but I think this is my actual favorite, is, um, is at the end of the book, uh, I just looked it up. It's on 728 out of 741 pages, very, very near the end, <laughs> mm-hmm. when through the bizarre um, uh, detail-oriented nature of the bureaucracy and the machinery of the bureaucracy, Nershin receives back his – finally gets back his volume of poetry oh, yes. of um, – I would pronounce it Yesenin, but uh, uh, Yesenin. 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 Mm-hmm. So Yesenin died tragically at 30. Uh, I right. looked this up. Uh, he died young. Uh, he was harassed by the NKVD, the Soviet police. Right. And um, he, I think, I don't know if this is true, but it says that he wrote his last poem with, in blood That's right. on his deathbed. Uh, Commit suicide. That's right. So this, this uh, physically broken. Uh, so this is a it's not a it's not a coincidence that that's the poet who Nershin is is he's not reading um, uh, somebody from the 19th century he's reading somebody who had died sure. a few decades before and this book is very precious as in every book in the book which is also mm-hmm. beautiful but th- he's trying to give the book away and he and he's he's struggling to do so and finally. He gives it to Spiridon, who's blind. So he gives this precious gift of a book to to a man who can't enjoy it. And in case you missed it, he has uh, is also a tragic moment right after where he reads Spiridon a letter mm-hmm. from his daughter because Spiridon can't read. He's blind, and I'm not sure he can read anyway. That's and, right. And so the the symbolism – that that Gleb Nershin is giving a book of of poetry, which is a book of poetry, is by definition uh, uh, it's a, it's about as pure a work of art as you can have. It's not going to do sure. anything, not going to help you sweep better. He gives it to a man who literally can't enjoy it, and mm-hmm. and there's something. I just I, it just broke my heart. I just that that yeah. that scene is just um, and just that whole 
chapter and, and chapters around it of farewell or, or the vividness of them. And, and part of it, of course, we talked about this a little bit the last time. We're As the reader, we're saying goodbye to the characters. So as they say goodbye to their friends and get on to the, into the wagon, mm-hmm. we're feeling the same emotions that everyone's feeling like, well, maybe we won't see them again. Yeah. Anyway, it's it's a it's just such a a tremendous, beautiful work of art. And um, right. I'll let you uh, conclude, Kevin, with anything else you want to add about it. Well, I'm, I might triangulate off of what you just said about Yesenian, the poet, and this book of poems that um, Gib leaves him. Um, in actual fact, there were three books that Solzhenitsyn, the person, not the writer, that Solzhenitsyn took with him when he was sent off into the Gulag camps. One of the books, factually, was Yesenian, a book of poems by Yesenian, who, by the way, was Solzhenitsyn's obvious his favorite poet, but he was his uh, Solzhenitsyn's favorite poet because Yesenian's poetry dealt so much with the lives of peasants and the lives of rural Russia. Um, the second book that Solzhenitsyn takes, of course, is, is a copy of the Bible, and the third book. Um, is a copy of Vladimir Dahl's um, collection of Russian proverbs. Hmm. Proverbs are unbelievably important to Solzhenitsyn's fiction, at least. This is something I'm arguing in the book that I'm currently writing, uh, a book that uh, essentially addresses the influence of Russian proverbs or the role of Russian proverbs on Solzhenitsyn's fiction. But at any rate... um, this this parting with Spiridon, there could not be anything that Solzhenitsyn could leave to his great close friend Spiridon than the, the one book that means more to him, um, Nierzhin, than anything else. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful way to kind of have that parting scene between two very close individuals. Uh, here's... Uh... Yasinin wrote his last poem in in blood because he, ah. could, he couldn't find any ink. Yeah. Uh, and there's some dispute about whether he committed suicide. Some say he was assassinated. But mm-hmm. his his last poem is very brief. It's uh, I'm going to read it. It's called "Goodbye, My Friend, Goodbye." It's very also appropriate for the mm-hmm. closing of the novel. It's, it goes. This is in translation, obviously. Farewell, my good friend. Farewell, in my heart forever. You'll stay. May the fated parting foretell that again we'll meet up someday. Let no words, no handshakes ensue, no saddened brows and remorse. To die in this life is not new, and <laughs> living's no newer, of course. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Really beautiful. Um, and, and, you know, and, I, and I think I, I, maybe I'm misremembering this, but I feel like somewhere in, in the first circle there there's a – they. They refuse to make a grand farewell because, of course, they want to at least pretend they'll see each other again. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if – did Solzhenitsyn – Ruben was his the, – the character that Ruben's based on was, was Solzhenitsyn's friend. Did they did they ever – do you know if they saw each other outside the camp when, they, when oh, yes, Solzhenitsyn yes. got freed? Um, uh, I think it's roughly 1957. Um, when – well, let's do it this way. In roughly 1955 – All of the Zeks are freed from the gulags. They're not allowed to return home, however. They have to live on in what is called um, Gichne Silka, eternal, oops, what do you say? Eternal, um, oh boy. Exile? Exile, thank you. I couldn't come up with that. Um, But by roughly 1957, 1958, um, there is a proclamation of freedom whereby um, these people who are living in eternal exile now may return home to their cities. Very interestingly, Solzhenitsyn uh, does not return home to his, let's say his native home, Rostov, where he had left. Uh, he goes to, and this is the, the short story, Matrona's house or Matrona's home. Uh, as as the protagonist of that short story writes, having just got out of prison himself, 
I wanted to go to the real Russia. Hmm. And by the real Russia, he means the Russia of Yesenian, the Russia of Turgenev. And, by the way, uh, by extension, the real Russia that Solzhenitsyn finds for himself in Vermont, where he settles for 17, 18 years uh, after he has been kicked out of the Soviet Union. Well, my guest today has been Kevin McKenna. Kevin, I want to thank you for being part of Econ Talk and enriching my understanding and I'm sure our listeners' understanding of this great book. Uh, well, I thank you for this opportunity to kind of share some of my thoughts and insights, particularly because later today I'm going into one of my classes where we're um, reading. It's a class on the fiction of Solzhenitsyn. So this always helps me to kind of organize some of my thoughts. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.